Hello, and welcome to the BYU Library Family History Webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. Professor Minor will let me know that um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and he will address them throughout the presentation so you don't have to wait till the end. Um, so our next webinar is on March 9th with Catherine Grant. She will be giving a presentation entitled Family Tree Reason Statements Made Easy. Note that we will not have a webinar next week on March 2nd due to Roots Tech. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Roger Meinert, who will be giving a presentation on German census records from 1816 to 1916. Before we begin, here is a little bit about Roger. Roger P. Meinert received his doctoral degree from The Ohio State University in German language history and second language acquisition theory. He taught German language and history for 10 years and then became a professional family history researcher. Accredited by the Family History Library for research in Germany and Austria, he worked for 12 years as a private genealogical researcher. From 2003 to 2019, he served as a professor of family history at Brigham Young University. The author of 208 publications, he directs the research program German Immigrants in American Church Records, and the series now consists of 38 volumes. In 2019, Minert was recognized for his years of service to the Palatines of America Society and also received the Shirley Reimer Life Lifetime Achievement Award from the International German Genealogy Partnership. And we'll go ahead and turn the time over to Roger to share his screen. So our audience is brought into this PowerPoint presentation. Yes, it's a wonderful privilege for me to be part of this great BYU Family History Program. I've made several presentations in the past and look forward to doing more in the future. And yes, you may ask your questions through Olivia throughout the presentation. I've never liked the idea of waiting to the very end. And since I'm not reading from text, I can be easily readily interrupted. I would ask, of course, that your, your questions be spot on, right on target there, or I might need to delay my response. So with that in mind, we have about an hour to deal with a fascinating topic here. That is, if I can remind myself how I move on from screen to screen. Something new. Uh, some of you might know about this, this new census topic, new in the last six years for that matter. But for this to you, we don't often get the chance. We, we constantly work in church records. We work in civil records to a smaller degree. And then in many, many other kinds of records to a very uh, seldom degree, so to speak, infrequent. So this may be new to you. I'm not sure exactly when I became so fascinated with census records, but I'm going to share with you the process of learning about them and the results. Well, this is the first place we go when your neighbor comes around and says, you know, I've been thinking about my family tree and I need to, to do some more work. All I know is about my grandfather born in Ohio or something. Where do I start? We go straight to the American census. Then every 10 years on the O, everything but 1890 is preserved. That's a tearjerker. Standard form used everywhere, every state, every territory in a given year. And of course, you can access these through two or three different channels there, digitally, right at home, where I told my students I could work with my kitty cat popcorn and music. I didn't invent this. I saw this in 1993 on a car in Salt Lake City. Old genealogists never die, they just lose their senses. Don't attribute that to me. Oh, by the way, there are hand, there's a handout, four-page handout. I sent that to Olivia. She is authorized to distribute that to everybody, so you don't have to be frantically writing notes on everything I say. The PowerPoint, of course, doesn't match exactly the handout, but the handout has the critical information that you'll need in working with German census records. So what about census in Germany? Ask the experts. You would have gotten these responses. And I remember this because in the Family History Library, I worked there for 12 years as a private contractor, and I donated my Wednesday mornings as a 
free, feeless consultant there at that great location we used to call the island there on B1 in the Family History Library, now the Family Search Library. Now here's what we used to tell people. Well, we know there was one in 1819, mecklenburg schwerin marvelous detail. We know there was one in Schleswig-Holstein because the Danish had it, and there was an overlap between Danish and, and German government during that time, every five years. And the great gazetteer for Prussia on the front page, it says based on the census of 1905, but nobody ever asked what census of 1905. We just used that gazetteer. Well, I was making a presentation in Bremen up there in North Germany one day, and somebody came up and said, do you know about the 1852 census in Hanover in the old province? I said, no. And they told me all about that, but nobody in Salt Lake knew anything about it. I didn't either. So I would have given you the same answers as everybody else. And of course, we tossed in this caveat. There were probably other census records compiled in other states, but we don't know for sure. Well, Ike Apis, the interesting man, 50-year genealogist. I've done genealogical research in Westphalia, that's Western Northern Germany, for more than 50 years. I've written more than 100 books. I've never seen a German census record this is a great discovery. I actually met with him and my publisher. We have the same publisher up in, in Wuppertal. And he saw some of the, the, the documents I was collecting in 2015. He was, a, he was amazed by this stuff. Okay, so these questions I formulated. In which states were census records enumerated? When were they done? For what purposes? That's important. Remember, in the United States, we did that in order to establish representation in the House of Representatives and to apportion direct taxes, which we no longer do. What content did each one have? You remember, in the United States, the content increased every year. More questions. Do original records still exist? Where can they be found? Where are they stored? Have any of them be, been copied, microfilmed, digitized? And how can researchers gain access to those records? Well, obviously, I needed to answer all these questions to cover the topic appropriately. But from my days at, at The Ohio State University, I knew very well that I couldn't launch into this kind of examination study unless I found out if anybody else had done it before. Well, if it's already been done, of course, there's no need for me to do it. So. You know these as proper steps in the academic process. I found one major article about types of census records written in English by German. One book about census years and regulations, but no examples of any pages. No publication about census contact by year, content by years. Many publications about the statistics compiled from the census enumerations. Nearly every state could offer that. Well, when we think about the census records for genealogy in Ohio in 1870, we don't care really about the numbers of people in Ohio. We want to find our great-great-grandfather and learn where he lived, what his family looked like, his occupation, his property, all kinds of neat things. Whether there were, you know, we didn't care about how many people lived in the county for that matter, how many in the state of Ohio. That didn't bother us. So. Now, this is interesting. This is written by the man who, at a North German think tank, a demographic think tank, wrote the article in English. The history of German census records has not yet been written. Ta-da! Here is my mandate. I'm going to write that. That's the goal, of course. Academics are always looking for a way to close a gap in the literature, find out something nobody's written about. And in, in family search, we're always looking for one more document, are we not? You're nodding your head, I can't see you, but you're nodding your head, I'm sure of that. So the grand goal is a book on German census records. So I had to, first of all, determine what Germany am I talking about? Where are the borders of this Germany? If I were to ask you on a quiz, what's the founding date of the German empire? You would say, oh, 1871, everybody knows that. Wait a second, let's 
that's a hundred years nearly younger than the United States, and we're a young nation. So I have to determine the time constraints. I needed to go back before 1871 because many of you are saying, but my ancestors came here before 1871. I need to find them in the years prior to that time. Then, of course, I had to communicate with archives all over the country, design my approach, which archives, what am I going to ask them? And, you know, this kind of thing just cannot be done at home with telephone calls, letters, emails, <clears throat> websites. It just doesn't work. So I immediately applied for a sabbatical leave. I know you're thinking, this is terrible suffering. <laughs> you just got to go to Europe and live there for a while to do this work. That is so difficult. And this is going to cost a lot of money. So here's what I decided for my geographical extent, geopolitical extent. This is the German Empire as it existed from 1871 to 1918, when, as you know, after World War I, it was significantly reduced in size. But these are the states. There are 38 of these states, some called duchies, grand duchies, kingdoms, principalities, provinces, free cities. There are all kinds of neat designations. There are 38 of them. And this is not the kind of clean map like our 48 states in the continental United States. We have all kinds of funny colors in different places. I'm not sure if anybody's told you this, but working in Germany and family history may be the toughest thing you can do compared to other countries, and I shouldn't name them because other people might debate that with me. So 38 German states under the German Empire from 1871 to 1918. And before that time, the number vacillates between 38 and 41. 1816 to 1916. Why? Well, uh, some of you know that after Napoleon was finally driven out of the German areas, uh, all the leaders of the states, those political entities, met in Vienna for quite a long time, nearly a year. They redrew the maps of the German Empire. Germany wasn't a country, so there was no way for a German government to defend themselves against what other people wanted to do, like France and Austria. 1916, because there was a census scheduled in the empire for 1915, but due to, well, they're in the middle of a war, it was put off for one year. So that gave me exactly 100 years to deal with. Before 1816, uh, there are so many German states, it would have been undoable. I'd still be working on it today with no hope of finishing soon. So we got one solid century. <clears throat> now, there are lots of ways that the family search catalog has identified census records. And I know, just like many of you know, that the catalogers are totally overwhelmed there. They've got to look at something in a matter of seconds, make a decision, <laughs> and describe the record as such. Volkszählung is the official word for census, a counting of the people. But census records in Salt Lake can also be found under Bürgerbuch. It shouldn't be there. Haushaltsvorstandslisten shouldn't be there. Hauslisten, Einwohnerregister. These should all be in the handout for you. Uh, even military lists, lists of subjects to the crown. But Volkszählung is a separate kind of document, a separate process with separate justifications. So my initial contact, I wrote to state and regional archives. And here I'm dealing, of course, with today's German map. We have a much smaller Germany than in the empire days. We have 16 states rather than 38. So I've got to worry, about, and, and many of the borders are not the same as they used to be. And this is in interesting. Some archives said, no, we've never had a census in this state. Some said, well, yes, the census enumerations were, were executed here, but we only have the numbers now. We don't have any idea what they looked like. I like this. This goes back to the guy in the think tank who wrote this in English. And it's amazing because he didn't contact any archives on the county or civil level. In general, census records are kept in local archives, local archives. And the central archives, there's often more than one in each federal state, are not always informed of their existence. More research must be done in this field. 
I like that. That was really an insightful comment on his part because he didn't do any of that research. Sabbatical design. Okay, got to go live in Germany. We're writing about that. And some of you are saying, just a cotton pick and second hair professor, that's not Germany. That's the picture taken from, from the Belvedere Palace in Vienna. Well, I have to tell you how we got there. So I got all these permissions. So decisions, chair said yes, everybody said yes, great. Oh, look at the last one. My wife agreed to the use of family resources. We knew there wouldn't be enough money here to pay for this. But in her wisdom, she said, if you think this is that important, we'll use family resources where needed. Now, you don't just jump on the plane and fly over to Germany. Oh, by the way, part of her support, as she always supports me in what she considers righteous endeavors, but part of her support was, listen, uh, I love Vienna. I've lived there for years and years. I've never lived in Germany like you have. Vienna's only three hours drive from the border toward Munich and that we can go from Vienna over through archives and journey then back to Vienna. Let me live in Vienna for six months. I said, that is worth it because you will be spending a lot of time in Germany. You will be sacrificing for this effort. So we'll go to Vienna. Unfortunately, the BYU apartment there was available. So I hired Jeline Maines, brilliant, brilliant researcher. She took the Family Search Library catalog apart bit by bit in my 16 years jeline mains living in springville the best student i ever had what a brilliant mind wow she found about 100 census records using all those 10 different category descriptions she wasn't going to stop simply with census she wouldn't have gotten more than a few dozen wow we copied everything we possibly could, actual lists, regulations, the laws uh, that were used as the basis for the enumerations. In the meantime, I was sending hundreds of emails to archives of counties and major cities to inquire whether they had any in their holdings. The two of us, over nearly a year's time, probably invested 500 hours before I ever got to Germany. Okay, that's the process. Here's a map up to Europe. Living in an apartment in Vienna, communication from Vienna, I planned all the trips into Germany. Where to go, exact times, exact uh, appointments. You've got to have appointments to work in these archives. Trip one, trip two, trip three. Look at that all over the map from Vienna. Vienna's in the bottom right corner there in the southeast. Organizing, analyzing, translating documents between trips, writing more emails, making more appointments. Wow. And organizing the thousands of documents and writing the book. So this is a funny line. I've heard that there were census records made now and then, but I've never seen one. You won't find one in this archive two or three times. We've found them. And we found them because if you look in their archive catalog, I could name a couple of states, but I shouldn't. You'll find that there's nothing under census. But if you apply the same other categories, the housing lists and the voter lists and things like that, you'll find them. So I remember one, one case, I happened to be talking to the director and the staff member had brought me a big cardboard box of documents. I opened it up and the very first page there, dated 1843, said Volkszählung. And he said, how did you find this? Where did you find this? And I told him I looked under the other categories. He said, I had no idea we actually had census records here. That happened three times. And one of the times, the director was not happy because he had insisted, we don't have any. And I thought I was doing him a favor by showing them those. He was not happy. Okay, results. Nine flights, 4,000 miles, 3,000 images. Good heavens. Sufficient information to write 34 chapters. The other four chapters were based on Prussian provinces now in Poland. I went to the University of Vienna, advertised and found a native Polish gal whose German was superb and hired her to communicate in Polish with archives there. Found great stuff, much better stuff than I thought I could find in Poland. Can we answer the original eight questions? Yes. And I'm going to say we can do this reliably. 
Now, I, I've described the process for you because if I just said, well, I wrote a book on census records, you might be wondering, can you rely on the information I have? Can you believe, do you have confidence that I've given you the right information? So now that you know all this lead up and the process, I mean, we love living in Vienna, but all day while she's enjoying going to her favorite museums time and again, I'm writing endless emails, translating documents, writing the chapters so I could come home with the, the book nearly done after six months. So here we go. In which German states were censuses conducted? Enumerated, it would be the official word. Every single one of 38 states. Now, this contradicts several archivists who said, no, no, they were done in other places in Germany, but we never had them here. Every one of 38. When were they conducted? Many of them did this every three years from 1834 to 64 and many before that time now we're doing this only in 10 years so from 34 to 64 we have 40 50 60 only three but here we have 10 we have 11 in that time period in germany wow prussian provinces 16 times how often did we do it from 1818 to 64 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, five times. They did them 16 times. Is your genealogical mouth starting to water here? Because, wow, so many of these things. Some states only as few as three before 1867. Mecklenburg Strelitz comes to mind. But that's a rarity. I think only two states did it that rarely, but they still did it. Everybody, all 38, participated in all 10 from 1871 to 1916. So they did it in 1871, the first year they existed as a nation. Then 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 100, 5, 10, 15 was delayed by one year. And I ended at that point because we lost so much territory in Germany after that. And by the way, census records, census enumerations in Germany became very sporadic, relatively rare. And we did the last one in 2021. I actually brought a, a long form copy home with me. I participated. I was counted in the 2021 census in Germany. For what purposes were the censuses conducted? Now, if you're looking very carefully, you're saying, uh, Professor Minor, you cheated. That's an American picture. That's George Washington hanging above the mantle. I'm sorry, but can we just pretend that, that the guy is close to Darmstadt in Hessen and he's recording the information about the family, father, mother, and children, one, two, three, four, and then a maid who's probably not a family member but lives and works here. 1854. We could just really put that into Germany. From 1667, distribution of customs revenue. What in the world? Other administrative purposes. Interesting. We see nothing here about counting the number of people for the parliament or what they call the Landtag, the local parliament, the local legislative body. Why? Because most states didn't have them. And clear up to 1871, clear up to 1945. They act well, technically 1918. They still had four kingdoms, a number of grand duchies, a number of duchies, free cities, provinces. So those people, as you might know from your study of German history, were not interested in sharing their power with the locals. So whereas we're counting people here, so we make sure that Utah has the appropriate number of representatives in the house, they're not doing that for any such reason. Let's look about look at this in more detail. Oh, I love the the last ones. By the way. these are great because census records in that time will count the number of building structures, the number of residences, and the number of other things like factories, garages, barns. They count the number of 
cherry trees, apple trees, things like that. Those census enumerations are fascinating. I don't believe we've ever done that on ours. Okay, now here's how the customs unions work. The first one was between Prussia, Prussia and Hessen, 1828 to 33. Bavaria and Württemberg, 1828 to 33. This is actually a very good example. These two South German states, east-west next to each other, the idea was this. Instead of having everybody going from Württemberg to Bavaria or back, cross a border, pay duties on their products, they erased the border police along there. By the way, that means you don't have to try to find all the smugglers who are sneaking through the forest. They said anybody coming into Bavaria and into Württemberg from any other place, we will take all of the fees that we've exacted on their products and put them together into one big pot. Then we'll count all the people in Bavaria and all the people in Württemberg. And let's say Bavaria has 55% of the population they will get 55% of the money out of that pot. So here we have a tremendous amount of money coming into these two states, divided up based on the population as counted. Now, how well will people count? You can tell. They're going to count extremely well because the more people they count, the higher percentage of the monies they're getting that, that have been collected at the border points. <clears throat> this has all kinds of ramifications because every time you cross a border in Germany and you have to pay the fees, that adds to the cost of your products and the consumer at the end of the line has to pay more money to buy that product. So the customs unions have really important benefits to them. Central one from 20 to 33, tax union, this is up in North Germany. Especially the North Germans who didn't want to join the Prussian, they were thinking, you know, Prussia is pushing this customs union stuff. We think they're going to push that into the political realm. We're going to stay out of the customs unions. So how does a union work? Order station, no longer necessary. Collect all that stuff. And you count them. We get the proportion percentage of the monies. Wow. So uh, whereas in the United States, especially in, in the early days, 1820, 30, 40, people might say, I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to be home when the when the census taker comes because he'll probably tell, when he asks in 1850 the value of my property, just to cotton pick in second, he's going to transfer that to the tax people who will come and raise my taxes because I told him what I paid for my property. I'm not going to tell him. I'm going to invent a number that's not true. I'll just sort of underestimate it. Or forget it, I'm going to be in the forest. Nobody's going to be home when he comes knocking on my door. So we think that because of that, the census records of the United States couldn't possibly be complete and correct, but they probably do represent a best effort on the part of the Bureau of the Census, which is the Department of Commerce. Well, on we go. Here's what the map looks like then by 1866. The Prussian Census or Customs Union is, of course, dominant. I mean, look at that. But Notice, up in the north, Alsace-Lorraine is not involved. Up in the north, Mecklenburg, Schleswig-Holstein, Lübeck, Hanover, they kept out of this until they were really forced economically into it because everybody else is gaining, gaining money and power by doing this. Eventually, the North German states figured, nah, we better, you know, we can't beat them, so we better join them. But this is why they did census enumerations. Okay, so... What content did each census include? You remember that in the first census, 1790, we had nothing more than name of head of household, number of persons in his family by gender and by age group, like under 10, 10 to 16, 16 to 26, things like that. But only one person was named head of household until 1850 when we got everybody involved. So by 19, let's see, 2000, I was privileged to receive the long form of the 2000 census, 53 items. I studied them very carefully. And just like in the United States, 
census content increased gradually in all states over the years. The government asked more and more and more. And some people, like I said, rejected that, saying they, they have no right to ask about all this stuff. Now, the household portion of this list, so this is the basic until the 1840s for the most part. Name of the head of household and numbers of household members by gender, status, occupation, religion. More detail than we had in 1810, 20, 30, and 40. Definitely more detail. Or listen, this is the best word you can look for in the census world in Germany. List of all inhabitants, names of all persons, their gender, their age, specifically or in categories, religion, status or occupation, status as in housewife or child or going to school, things like that. Ur listen, the best thing you could have. Keep that in mind when you write your emails to different archives in Germany. Okay, this is what we really need to know. Do original census records still exist? Yes. Here's my opinion. I have seen at least 20,000 original pages. I'm talking about pieces of paper of census records with the names of heads of household or all individuals. Because as my wife visited archives all over Germany, we would sit in one archive and look at the census enumerations for 16, 18, 20 different years. And we could see, and we took pictures of every one of them, by the way. I have an enormous collection of documents. The goal was to collect two things for every census in every state. Number one, the, the laws and regulations. Why is this being done? What are the instructions to the enumerators when they go house to house? Number two, what does the actual record look like? So we were after hundreds and hundreds of sample documents. I believe that there are hundreds of thousands of such pages in Germany, France, and Poland. The French maintain German documents in their archives because by international contract, by international agreements, any record written in town X is to be returned to town X no matter which country town X is in today, which means those thousands of German towns in the empire era that now are in Poland, any original document written in those towns is to be returned to Poland to its birthplace. That's, that's the international agreement. Good for all of Europe. I don't know if it goes for any place else. Okay, now where are they stored? Most are in city and town archives. So the local level, 85%. These are my estimates. Some regional archives, very, very few in state or national archives. Only in Niedersachsen, Lower Saxony, that's modern state, did we find very much in regional, uh, in state or national archives. Now, these are my estimates, and all modesty aside, I don't believe anybody else anywhere is qualified to make those estimations in the, in the three years it took me to do this, study this book, by processes that I have described to you pretty well. I think I'm in, I'm in a position to give you a good idea what your chances are of finding these. I'm not going to write to Munich to the State Archive of Bavaria and ask about this. Well, here's the conundrum. You might be saying, but Bavaria is all I know about my Tennessee ancestor. That's all we've ever found out, Bavaria. Well, Bavaria has 35,000 towns. We've got to do something better in the United States. I may have an idea there to help you. Have original census records been copied, microfilmed, digitized? Some are available on microfilm in the family search system. I indicated that Jolene Mayans found probably 100 of them. And boy, was that a great start. Because right there from her work, we knew that something great could be achieved. So some available on microfilm. By the way, yes, uh, that comment in parentheses is good because especially in East Germany back in the 1980s, Microfilmers from genealogical 
society were allowed to come in, but not to shoot church records. They shot court records and land records and census enumerations because they were not allowed to copy church records. Some you can find in digital images on the internet. There's no system for this now. You can't say this is done everywhere in Bavaria. You cannot say this is done everywhere in Germany in 16 states. Indexes, extremely rare. You're saying, well, gosh, darn it, because in the United States, essentially every existing census has been indexed with better or lesser good quality. But we love to go straight to the indexes. Well, that's not going to be true in Germany. In fact, there's only one place I know of up in Hanover, the 1852 census has been partially indexed but I believe the group that started to do that in Bremen sort of burned out. They produced maybe 30% of the, of the area. They're terribly important, of course, because look at all the Hanoverians that came to the United States before, 18, before our war between the states. Wow, what a marvelous thing that is, especially since 1850s, the greatest decade of immigration to date in the United States. Okay, how can researchers gain access? This is where you're going to be studying very carefully the handout that Olivia can make available to you. <clears throat> you contact the town or the county. Well, once again, you're wiping the tears away because you're saying, Professor Miner, all we know is the Rhineland. And the Rhineland has 8,000 towns. Well, that's true. You can't write to every county. Well, I guess you could. There are dozens of counties in the Rhineland. I don't know how much money you're going to put out doing that. How many archivists? I mean, every archivist but one will not be profitably spending his time. So, no, the census records are not the be-all, end-all. The church record is more important, but... At the same time, if you can't tell me the count, town or county, you can't access the church records either. <clears throat> Do you know about Meyer's Orts und Verkehrsverzeichnis, the Gazetteer, the place name index for the entire German Empire, published 1912-1913? Well, if you have a town name, you can get the county name there. But we want to write to the lowest level government archive possible. <clears throat> now, none of this will be free. Government archives have standard fee schedules. So be prepared. And in your communication, always state politely, I will gladly pay the appropriate fees for the services I'm asking you to render. You might get a response free, by the way, but you've got to offer this. <clears throat> what good are census records of the family history researcher? Well, they may point to the home parish in which church records provide greater genealogical details. Greater because, of course, even though the census records can give us a family group, they cannot give you birth records. They can give you birth dates, but not birth records with parents, things like that. In the absence of church records, census records may be the only record of a family group. That's important. And now this is interesting. In the United States, we never, well, we believe that census enumerators never wrote down the names of people in the family who weren't in the structure at that time. It says on the top of the page, the following persons lived here on this date, the date, day, month, and year on the top of the page in the United States. Well, finally, what experienced genealogist would say no to one more record? We're after one more record, military, voter lists, land records, anything we can get. Okay, <clears throat> here's the deal. I found this beautiful census record. <clears throat> I can't read this quite because my picture is in the way. Oh, there we go. Jeannie, hey, hey, there was a daughter named Amalia who didn't come to Baltimore with the family in 1853. She might have died or just stayed in Germany. We didn't know anything about her. Jeannie, are you listening? <laughs> now, some of you are thinking, yeah, that's what happens when I talk to my husband. That's when I talk to my wife. I make this fabulous discovery. 
and they don't quite appreciate it as I do. Well, there we go. Let's look at some, some typical documents. Instructions handwritten by the court recorder who is a paid, trained writer, scribe. 1832, Grand Duchy of Baden. Every county got this instruction. So for the, let's say, 25 counties in Baden, uh, the man had to write these, this full thing out, and it could have been six pages. Okay, in Gießen, once again, okay, this goes from the Grand Ducal Palace in Darmstadt to the county of Gießen. And the same thing would have been done to every other county in the Grand Duchy of Hessen, 1843. Wow, this one for the Rhine province. This is one of 1817, the Rhineland became part of Prussia. 11 pages of very clearly typed, printed instructions. Wow, if you were the enumerator, you would have taken many hours to make sure you know what you're supposed to be doing. Now, just to let you know that before 1816, there were census enumerations. I simply considered this an undoable project to go ahead and try to find them all in not 38 states, but how about 150 states 200 years earlier? So, But they do exist. Here's a, a head of household census. It's called Volkszählung. This is a real census. I found it up there in Heide Holstein, and I immediately took a picture of it. So up above you have the columns to the right are male, female, children. This is under this is under sixteen, and then the number of male uh, males working in the home who are not family members and females. Okay, eighteen twenty eight head of household census. So over to the left in the second column, this is the surname of the family, and then in the top one it says the number of people living there. Seventeen in the Luffermann family. Good heavens. One girl under 14, six men, two women in the next category. Wow. Anyway, so we get a good idea. This is a huge household of Luffelmann in 1828. 1829. Now, the first time in the United States. Tell me when we had the first time everybody's mentioned. You're right, 1850. This is 21 years earlier. Every person is there by name. And by description, he happens to be a tailor. His wife is here. He's quite a bit older than her. But then way down here below are little kids. There must be a few more who have left the household because she's 32 years older than him. Oh, wait a second. There's an 11-year-old. Right, 32 years older and then one and a half, 10 years later. So, and once again, we have, we have some categories for gender and age. 1829, this is really early, in Pomerania. 1840, Urlisten, every single person's here. On top of that, every page pre-printed with those, those beautiful Fraktur typeset titles on top. Only one family per page. Good heavens, this is marvelous. By the way, this is the left side page. The right side page has much more detail for these people. They live in house number 291. Wow, what a great record. 1840, 1864. This format was used in a number of different states. But once again, one household per page. Great detail. Good heavens. Age there, gender. Looks like in this case, the head of household is the grandmother. So the father and the grandfather are both deceased, is our assumption. Here's the mother. She's 25 years younger. Then we have a daughter, 21 years younger, and a son, four years after her. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Individual. Now, this might be stunning. Every single person in Germany, all 40 million in 1875, this is the national census, will have their own card. Now, I have to admit if I were the archivist in 1875, I don't know that I would do anything but take the numbers off these, the numbers, the genders, by city, by county, by state. I don't know that I would try to save 40 million documents 
like this. But look at the detail here. Year of birth, what's your status, married, single, religion? And what kind of occupation do you have? Education, what's your actual citizenship? Where do you live? Oh, my heaven, gays, military service. Fabulous. Okay, now, I'd like to hand out some awards at this point. Looks like we're doing pretty well on the time. Haven't had any questions yet, but I'm still ready for them. By state. Most frequent census campaigns, mecklenburg schwerin This is going to blow you away. 41 consecutive years. Head of household, 1828 to 1868. Every year, they did a census of head of household. They called it census. This is not a housing list. Well, you can call it that too, but it should be officially registered in the archives and the catalogs as census. The most valuable single census here goes to Mecklenburg Schwerin again. 1819 gets this full name of every person. Full birthday. I should have put that there. Full name of every person. Full birth date. Place of birth. Now, the next one is going to bring tears of joy to your eyes. Parish of place of birth. Now, you know, at least you should have been told long ago, that the overwhelming majority of German towns do not have a church. I would say, at best, one in eight towns would have a church. Well, if you have the town name of birth, you can't get the church records until you can identify the parish, which we can do with lots of good gazetteers. Experts can do this. But this census tells you, born in Friedrichshafen and went to church in Dombeck. Ta-da! Okay. Most names of all individuals. Prussia. Nine of the 13 provinces Every name list began in 1840, 10 years before the United States. Best preservation of census records. Here we have a problem. Whereas in the United States, we believe we have everything but the 1890 census, for which we have a couple dozen pages or something like that, essentially nothing. So we beat probably any other country in that regard. Germany is tougher. The Principality of schaumburg lippe a little tiny one, edged up there between Hesse and Nassau and Westfalen and Hannover. All pages, heads of household, for the years 1836 through 67, 11 enumeration years without a gap, available for study in the Lower Saxony State Archive in Brickeburg. That's uh, about 45 minutes west of Hanover on A2 on your way to the Netherlands. So, wow, what a fabulous thing. And in this case, the archive director didn't know he had them until we found an odd loose leaf on a shelf somewhere in this gigantic library. He says, let's look at that. And it says, these are the microfish. Went to a microfish cabinet, and there they are. They're all microfished. So for the rest of the day, my wife and I uh, looked at and copied pages out of microfish. Census collections and state archives. Nida's Exeshit Landesarchiv. There are seven regional archives. This is what used to be all of Hannover, all of Oldenburg, Schaumburg-Lippe, and a tiny bit of Hessen-Nassau. They have the best collections. Now, remember, we're going to go on to city and county first. But these exist as well. Wow, look at all these. All of those are in the seven different archives. We had a great, great uh, day of work in the Oldenburg archive, where they brought out book after book after book, box after box of little town census records. It does happen that a, a city or county archives might say, we can't throw these away. We know they're important, but we can't. We can't digitize them very soon. That costs too much money. We can't keep them here. We have loads of additional things coming in. So they go upstairs to the to the district or state archive. Do you guys have room for these? And they might say, yeah, ship them over. Put them in the truck. Ship them to us. We'll take them. Best digitized census records. The towns of Dinkelsbühel and Mindelsheim in Bayern. 
and Minden and Westfalen. Now, this is something we have to watch out constantly because bit by bit, more and more towns will have the funding and the capability of making digital copies of papers. And we hope they get to the census records soon. So watch out for these. This is by no means, I'm sure somebody else has been added to this list in the last couple of years. Okay, best repository for German census records of all kinds. Ta-da, Family Search Library in Salt Lake City beats everybody. Now, when you go to Munich, they're not going to show you documents from Hanover or the Rhineland or Sachsen Kingdom. No. And over there, no. I mean, if you went to Lincoln, Nebraska, they probably wouldn't show you documents from Oregon and Texas. These people are all very strict in the interpretation of their borders. Okay, achievement of the goals. The book was completed. An article uh, I wrote, well, I was in Austria, living in Vienna. So took the streetcar down there, got off and walked a couple of hundred yards. And, and within a week or two, I'd written an article on the Austrian census records. And there again, the main archive said, I'm retiring in three months. I've been here for 30 years. Yes, we did census, census enumerations in Austria. You won't find any originals. I found originals in seven of eight states. By the time I did that, he was gone. I wasn't going to go back and rub it in the But the fact of the matter is, archives don't always know. Now, here are the contents of the book. History of the census records. Everybody does a census in 67. The entire German Empire. And then for each of the states, so I wrote 38 chapters, one for each of the states. Location, enumerations by date, regulations by date, content by date, accessibility. So if your people are in the Grand Duchy of Hessen, you can go to the chapter on Hessen, find out exactly how often they were done, what they were supposed to be recording by date. I'll show you that on the table here in a minute and how you can gain access to those records in Hessen. Okay, more content. How to write letters and emails to archivists. I give you the, the German and the English so you know what you're doing. How to prepare for your research visit. You want to go over there and go to the big archive in Darmstadt? Do it, but prepare carefully. Okay, so for each of the states, I have this kind of layout there. Across the top are the years of the enumerations up until the German Empire. Then everybody's the same. And then down the left side, you can see the kinds of information. And over the years, you see sparse, four or five different things in the first few years. And then we start adding all kinds of stuff in 1831, 34, 37, 40. <clears throat> Every chapter has one of these tables. <clears throat> so conclusion, I love this. Professor Miner went to Europe for six months in 2015 to learn my American genealogists know very little about German census records. While there, he learned that German genealogists know very little about German census records. That may sound funny to you, but it's true. It really is. Because rarely do I talk to people who there who say, oh, yeah, I've looked for census records. I knew about that. Very rarely in Germany. And I've given this presentation in Germany. Okay, I'm going to skip that. So the book's published in 2016. Do you like that? What are my dates? 1816 to 1916. I published it in 2016. That was accidental, but I like that. So you can order that through me or you can order it through Family Roots Publishing. I can save you five bucks or so. Now, a word from our sponsor. I appreciate your, your patience and listening to this. One of the ways we can get to the hometown of Germany is through the books German Immigration, German Immigrants in American Church Records. Where's the, where's the title there? We call it Geocker, German Immigrants in American Church Records. For 20 years, I've worked on this with my students. We have 38 volumes in about 18 states. We're working on Texas right now. But these darn students won't work for free. I mean, 10 hours a week. Why can't they donate that? Well, they're still students or they're former students. So we're working in Texas right now. We'll, we'll do two or three books there for sure. But the only way I can pay them to do that is to collect money either through the foundation. So if you go to germanresearch.org, you can flat out make a donation. And these are 
tax exempt on, at any age. In fact, over 72 or 73, whatever it is, where Uncle Sam says, you've got to take this much money out of your 401k. You can send it straight to our, to our or any other qualifying charitable institution, and it will be untaxed. Uncle Sam will, got, will get not one cent. Now, if you're thinking, well, you know, I'd like to get something out of this, great. Then go to my re website, rogerpminer.com. Any of those books you buy, the leading books in the field, or the rare ones, like, good heavens, the German census book, the only one ever written in the English language, the only one ever written in the German language, <clears throat> and to fill gaps in the literature. So you can buy those books. Every cent that comes into the website from things like speaker fees, if I go to conferences and they pay me, from all of the income from the books. My wife says, we don't need this. Our family's taken care of. So use every bit of money possible. Put it in to the German Immigrants and American Church Records Fund. So, and if you, oh, but here's another one. Go to the Roger P. Minor website. For $49, you can have a flash drive or download of my collected works, 129 books and articles in full text and the full bibliography for the rest, plus 27 of 38 volumes of German immigrants we have the indexes for. The publisher said, hey, put the indexes in because if people find their Schmidthorst name in the Northern Illinois book, they'll buy the book from me. Okay, great. So I want him to help. I want to help him sell books. So that way, see that 49 bucks every cent goes then into the fund to keep German immigrants and American church records alive and well. So we'd appreciate your help on that. And we can benefit you with either tax deductions or with actual literature to help you along your way. So here we are, three minutes left, but I will stay here as long as you and our hostess there. Olivia will allow. So let's do your questions. I hope we have some, and I hope you haven't just thought, he's going so fast, I can't get a question in sideways, but do it now, please. All right. It looks like we have one question from Janet. She says, end of the lecture question, suggestions for narrowing the German location for our ancestors. U.S. Census would state Germany or Bavaria or Prussia for my ancestors. Okay. Go right to our collection of German immigrants and American church records. The major libraries in the U.S. have them. The Family Search Library has them all. I've got them all on my shelf. You can hire me to search through all those. Or if you're in the Family Search Library, go to B2. <clears throat> they have all these. They have in two places. They have them on the U.S. Canada floor upstairs, the real books, and they have the real books on B2, where they've joined all the international books into one, one collection area. Look through every one of those. Fritz Jungling, one of the the career people there on B1 says, German immigrants and American church records, these books have changed the way we do Germanic research in the family search library. Because quite often, if all you know is Germany, you can go to those books, you might find, well, some people will report and say, I found my man in northeastern Indiana. We had no idea who was there, but that's where he married before he went on to Nebraska. Fabulous. Um, Let's see, uh, Professor Joe Everett of the of BYU, the Family History Library uh, director there, found one of his people by finding a brother in our Indiana Geocker book and traced him back to the German hometown where he found the birth record of the man, his direct ancestor. So those books are really important. If you can't get to the library, uh, I can... I can recommend a professional researcher you can hire to go through them all, or you can all go through all the 38 volumes on my shelf here and ask you for a modest contribution to the program. So, but that collected works flash drive is a mini library of so good heavens, so many different articles and books in full text, fully, fully readable right there on that flash drive or download. Next question. All right, we have a question 
From Rosemary, she says, are archivists in Germany willing to help with finding records if you send information for a particular family, if you know, or think you know the location of the family? Yes, archivists. Now, if they're either church or government archives, each archive has a fee structure established by, well, the church on a state level or the state on a state level. And they're certainly willing to do it, except now there are a couple that are not thrilled about it, and they express that by something like an 80 euro per hour fee, $85 an hour. What they're really saying is, we don't want to do this. But if you want us to do it, we'll do it for 85 bucks an hour. You may have a little trouble funding that. But yes, you can hire somebody in nearly every archive. Now, once in a blue moon, they'll say, the staff is too busy, but we can recommend qualified researchers, especially retired staff members who know the collections, who can read the old handwriting. So yes, they'll do it. Uh, save your Confederate money here because you'll need it. Or put together a family fund where you have people donate and say, I'm going to use this money to hire a researcher in Archive X to get more information about our people. All right, looks like we have one last question and then we can close. Laura says, is there information in your Austrian book about census records? Yes, there's a chapter, you bet. Because I wrote that article, I took that article, <clears throat> copyright is mine, and I put that into the book that Charlotte Noel, I say Charlotte because she's not Charlotte, Charlotte Noel Chamonois, and I wrote that book when we lived in Vienna in the Semester Abroad Program in 2018. And we made a very specific chapter in the Austria book on the Austrian census. The only place you can read, by the way, about the Austrian census is in my article, which is on the flash drive, or in the book, which you can buy from us. So you bet. And I, uh, they have census records in Switzerland as well. The census records there were conducted by the churches, especially in states like Bern and Zürich cantons. Census records will be found probably in every European state, but I can't tell you for how often in the Netherlands, how often in Belgium, how often in Poland. So, but this is the only book on the German census records ever written and exists in German and English. So I know you're busy doing other things. You've got to take off and get ready for dinner and things. Great, very grateful that you join us for this hour, and I hope that what I've described here can give you just a bit of confidence about looking at one more record you've never considered before or you've never heard of before. We're always looking for one more record. I've written about the Minor family trying to get them on a census record. I have not succeeded. It would have been nice. Our guy actually left in 1805, so I'd have to get his descendants in the 18. 20s, 30s, 40s, or a rare census document in that area of Germany before 1805, and some do exist. Hope springs eternal. We're never going to give up the idea that we're going to find one more document somewhere. So thank you so very much. And thanks to our host, Brigham University, and our hostess, Olivia Tuller. Good German name. Good luck to you all. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on March 9th with Catherine Grant. Um, it'll be entitled Family Tree Reason Statements Made Easy. Note that we won't have a webinar next week on Thursday because of Roots Tech. Um, you can access a recording of this webinar next week. Um, it will be posted on YouTube as well as our website and the handout link will be available on that as well. Thank you and have a wonderful week.